Hey folks, this is Pastor Charlie Haynes with Jacob's Well Ministries, located down in Pearl River County, Mississippi. I want to just take an opportunity to invite you to come on the internet and watch our sermons each week by podcast. If you miss some of our sermons, you just simply go on there and look back in our archives and you'll find all of our past sermons there for you to look at uh, and to enjoy worshiping with us. Well, we invite you to come back often. Appreciate you. Thank you for worshiping with us at Jacob's Well Recovery Center for Women. If you would like to make a donation to this ministry, please make your check payable to Jacob's Well Ministries, 45 Buford Lane, Popperville, Mississippi, 39470. Jacob's Well is a Christ-centered addiction recovery center for women located just south of Popperville, Mississippi. For more information, please call 601-463-0022 or visit our website, www.jacobswellrecoverycenter.com. Until you are willing to face the truth about yourself, not anybody else around you, not what anybody else has done, until you're willing to face the truth about yourself, and what you have become, and what you are responsible for, and what you can do about it in Christ, you're not dealing in the truth. I think one of your biggest uh, trials that you had was when that young lady came in and brought a bunch of pills with her. And out of the whole house, she came. Now, this, is the, this is the crazy thing about this. Is my understanding is when people have pills or drugs, they don't like to share them. So I was always told by the ladies of the well. So what I find interesting about that situation was she not only wanted to share them with you, she sought you out in particular, and she didn't even know you. And so I think that was a huge trap set. Was it a trap or a test? Both. I agree. But you passed it. You were shaken. You were worn out. You were wounded. It opened up a lot of old wounds for you. But you passed it. You said no. When before you had always said yes. And so I think when that happened, the game changed for you. I think everything changed. And so this is not the time to sit back. There's going to be many more tests. There's going to be many more trials. And the thing when you go through those, you're going to have to keep this in mind. And that's Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says this, that his plans towards us are not for, our, it's not for evil, but it's for our future and it's for our hope. And so when those things come, remember problems come to push us in the position that he wants us to be in. And when those times come, you get ready for them. You remember who you are. You say no, not quietly, but you say no loudly to whatever comes your way. I'm so proud of you. I'm so honored to be the one to be able to give you your award. And here is your 90-day award. I am nervous, y'all. Um, I'm thankful to be here because I know where I was. Um, existing in a wasteland. Um, I'm going to read you a scripture from Psalms 42, and it says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand, which I look at it as being Jacob's well, and I'm so thankful to be here. I'm still standing. And I'm pressing on and pressing through. Somebody give it up for Tina Von Suda.
Come on this side, Tina. I'm, I'm, I'm having a good hair day on this side right here. I think this is the side that I... Is that okay? Can I have a good hair day? That's my skinny side. I don't think there's a skinny side anymore. Um, Tina, I, I want you to know that I'm, I'm honored to be up here and, and giving you this award. Um, but I, but I, I would, I don't want to get caught up in my excitement because there's a gravity here. The, you know, as sure as I, as sure as if I hold this Bible up or this uh, uh, certificate up of graduation and let it go, gravity will take its course. And though I'm so overwhelmed and I'm so excited about what God has done and is doing in your life, I know the gravity of the matter is that tomorrow will come and the next day and the next day and, and walking this out is the gravity of the issue. It's, 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 it doesn't seem the natural thing to do because we've done it for so long the wrong way. But I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of you, of where, how far you've come and what you've done uh, since you've been at Jacob's Well. Now, this is your first go around, and I get that. But in my book, you know, it's okay if I go around the mountain again. I just don't want to go around it for 40 years. Amen? Amen. Uh, if it takes a couple times for me to get it through my hard head, I'm okay with that. I don't really want the pain and the sorrow of all that, but I just don't want to keep going around the mountain. And uh, I just, I just, uh, I don't really want to use the word plead, but I want to challenge you from the depth of my heart uh, to, to see the wonderful uh, mercy and grace that covers you. Uh, and uh, and that's, what, that's what I see you walking in, is mercy and grace that is the cocoon for the purpose and greatness for God that is to, to in the days and the weeks and the years to come. And as you blossom out of this graduation into the activation of the things that you've learned, I really want you to grab a hold of so many things that have sunk down into the mirror of your soul. I remember I got, I got the opportunity to give you your, um, um, your 90 day award. And during your 90 day award, um, I read uh, I read Psalms 42, and part of that was was my tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, "Where is your God?" These things I remember. I pour out my soul. Uh, how I used to be, uh, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the the procession to the house of God, and you just struggled with so long, and and and, and your tears have come, have become instead of your food, there there are tears of joy. And I'm so glad on the second part of this psalm. It's interesting when you read a psalm, especially when David, because he starts out, "I am nothing at all. I am so." caught up in my sin and then by the end of the psalm he is he is just glorifying God and thanking you thanking him for his mercy and his grace and that's where we are in this when it goes on in Psalms 42 it says um, put your hope in God for I will yet praise him and this is David talking to himself okay for I will yet praise him my Savior and my God um, and this is interesting about David and I, I want to apply this to your life uh, and I want to be very purposeful in my in my implement of this, okay? So he goes on to say, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you in the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from the Mount of Mazar, deep calls into deep, in the roar of your waterfalls. David was able to say, although I'm going through a struggle in myself, I remember what you brought me through because it was in Jordan where he fought. It was in Hermon where he had one of his greatest battles. And then it was in Mount Mazar where God promoted him out of the greatest battle of one of, of one of the greatest battles in his life. But it was through the struggles came the breakthrough. Amen. So he remembers, he, he just remembers, in my struggle, oh God, you're still God. Whether or not all these situations are coming around me, you're still God. And I want to challenge you as you walk through as you walk this out after your graduation, after this point, walking and, and going on and having some time to yourself uh, and then doing the things that God has called you to do, I really want you to know you're going from the prison of, 
of, of shame and guilt and resentment, and the sh shackles have been broken off of you. Somebody say amen. amen. They have been blown away. But now it's time to walk in the prairie of mercy and grace, the openness and the freedom of that. And the one thing I really want to relate that to before I close and give you your, your certificate is that options are many. Options are many. But there's only one sure thing. And it's a narrow decision on a narrow road. And it's to follow the passion of a Savior that pursued you with all of his love. It's, it's something that, that shame, guilt, sin of life, the sin of life, the things of life have an end, and that's death. Whatever we find ourselves that brought us to Jacob's well has an end, and it's death. Ultimately, it takes us away from the presence of God, it takes us away from everything that we, that we want to love, and it ultimately ends us to eternal life you know, without Christ if we don't accept him as our Lord and our Savior. But love has no boundaries. Love has no end. And love is a continual mercy and grace and presence of God. God so loved you, Tina, that he gave his son for you. So as you walk out of this place into the purpose and the destiny for such a time as this, and you learn more about who you are and who God says you are and, and the creativeness of, of what you're developing in your own personal life and your mind and your heart, know that greater is in you, he that is in you, than greater than anything that can come against you. And the standard that surrounds you, the standard that surrounds you, the enemy will try to come in like a flood, but look to the standard, to God's righteousness, to his favor, to his redemptive nature in your life and know that I've been redeemed. I've been glorified by the God Almighty who created me for purpose and destiny. And you tell that to the devil. Amen? Amen. Well, Tina, here is your graduation certificate, and here is your mic. Congratulations. And somebody give it up for Tina Von Schroeder. Okay, this is something I uh, wrote back in October. It was in my journal. This was a letter to God. It says, Dear God, I thank you for loving me and moving in my life. Experiencing you is awe-inspiring and indescribable. I know I will never be the same, and for that I am truly grateful. I have done nothing to warrant your love, mercy, or grace, yet you pour it over and into me abundantly. At times the process is painful. My tears flow and my heart hurts, yet you give me hope, strength, and the assurance I need to get through it. The blessing on the other side is the strengthening of my faith, the building of my character, the healing of my heart, and a stronger desire, trust, and love for you. Um, I just want to thank God. I'm so grateful for what he's done in my life. And I want to tell you girls, most of all, that when you get here and the struggles come, the trials, um, and on days that you're just hearing Satan louder than God, just hang on. It's like when Jacob wrestled with God. You just, I don't know, you just say, God, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Just seek him. Just keep on because he's there. He's faithful. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He loves you guys. And y'all can do this. And to the staff, my family, I love y'all so much. Susan, Josette, I can't look at her because I'll cry. Um, Brother Charlie, Asa, Mandy, and especially Mandy, thank you for being so patient and persistent with me in counseling, helping me get some things out. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be up here talking right now because she knows I don't like to talk at all. <laughs> but I love you guys so much, and thank y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just never cease to be thankful for what God's doing in the lives of the folks that he places in our presence. And, and I, I, take, I take great seriousness in the fact that the women of Jacob's well and the families of Jacob's well are willing to come and share the most intimate parts of their family and intimate problems of their family with our family. 
It just blesses me. And it increases my faith. Um, so thank you, families, and thank you, ladies, for sharing your hearts with us. And I know it's hard sometimes. I want to just spend a minute this morning uh, talking to you about a word. The word is finally. Finally. And, and that's the first word in a group of scriptures we're going to look at this morning, the book of Ephesians. I'm not talking down to you. I'm, I'm just in case somebody doesn't know this, but the New Testament was not written in English. It was written in Greek. And if we want to understand the true meaning of a, of a word as we read the English versions of the Bible, we can go to a thing called a concordance, which will take us to the Greek word in the New Testament writings that was used for that English word. And it will also help us understand what the person meant when they were saying that word back in that time. And this word finally, in the Greek, used in this particular scripture, is a word called loipon, L-O-I-P-O-N. And its Greek translation is this, it remaineth then. It remaineth then. If you look up the word finally in the Webster's Dictionary, it will say something like, it's a conclusion that you have come to after considerable uh, study of the facts. It's a decision you come to after considerable study of the facts. And those of us in this room have been doing some considerable study of the facts about our life, how we've lived it, what's happened to us in it, the choices that we have made, the consequences we have found ourselves in. And most of us in this room are saying, you know what? It ain't working. Whatever it is I've been doing, whatever choices I've been making, whatever, it ain't working for me. It's not working for my children. It's not working for my family. It's not working for nothing. And so it is my prayer that today as we go through these scriptures together that you're going to come to a finally moment. And you're going to say, you know what? I'm finally going to accept the fact that I'm not in charge. I'm finally going to accept the fact that the way I'm living my life is an abomination to God. I'm finally going to come to the decision that God loves me, He created me, He has a plan and a purpose for me, and a hope and a future for me, and I ain't in it. I'm hoping somebody's going to come to that conclusion in here today as we go through this, this finally scripture and come into that final moment when the, the spiritual light bulb comes on. And you begin to live for God instead of for the world. In Ephesians 6 and verse 10, it says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord. Jeremiah 17 says, Cursed is the man <laughs> who listens to other people. Cursed is the man who depends on his own flesh for his strength. We need to depend on God for our strength. We need to depend on God for our future and our hope and our joy and our, and our peace in life. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power, not your power. We aren't bulletproof, although a lot of young people think they are. You're not bulletproof. You're not immune to being hurt or damaged or diseased or broken or killed. So be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. And I'm not talking about the Lord of the Rings. I'm not talking about the person that's lording over you in your life. I'm talking about Jehovah. I'm talking about Yahweh. I'm talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God whose Holy Spirit inspired the words that are sitting in front of me. The I Am the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Creator of all things, the one who is more interested in your future than anybody else on the planet, that God and His mighty power, not ours. Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And then he says this. He said, look, you've tried it your way, and it hadn't worked for you. So why don't you come on and just finally let me have your life. Finally rest in my mighty power. And just to show you how serious I am about how much I love you, here's some armor. 
I got some armor for you I want to give you this morning. And if you will put this armor on and keep it on and practice with it and use it daily as I have planned for you to do, you're going to live a much better life than the one you've been living. Oh, it's not going to be perfect. Problems are still going to rise. Things are going to happen. The things are going to come against you uninvited that you didn't even know were going to happen. But because you're going to have on the armor, you're going to be in better shape to get through it and come out on the other side than you are right now. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Right now, right this minute, there is not a living soul sitting in this room that the devil is not scheming against you right now. He's trying to say, okay, now they can sit up in this little church and play the little Jesus game this morning, but when they start to the car, watch how I mess them up. When they get in the car and start home, watch the argument I'm going to get started. When they get home this afternoon, watch them fight over what they're going to watch on television. I'm going to get them today before the day's out. I'm going to get them. He's always scheming. That's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. He's the devil. He's supposed to scheme and lie and cheat and manipulate. That's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he does. So the God's saying, put on this full armor so you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. Because, listen to me, my children that I created. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood. Ladies, your, str your struggle is not against the judge. Your struggle is not against the parole officer. Your struggle is not against the DHS worker. Your struggle is not against your mama. It's not against your daddy. It's not against your brother. It's not against your sister. It's not against your grandma and granddaddy. It's not against the person in the booth next to you at work. That ain't who it's with. That's not the way the battle is. God says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Listen. I don't know how much y'all watch football, but this week starts the playoffs. NFL playoffs. Now, I love football, but I've noticed something about it. Everybody is after the ball. Well, it doesn't matter if you're on offense or on defense. Get the ball. Knock the ball out of the hand. Grab the ball. Run with the ball. Get the ball. Score with the ball. You know what? Everybody in this room, you're a football in the game of life in the spirit realm. And the devil and God are looking for that football. So they're always going to be moving you out. You're not in charge. You're either going to submit to the lies of the devil or you're going to submit to the love of God. One or the other. But they're never going to stop warring because the war is going on in the heavenlies. It's not going on right here. And the sooner we understand the power of that, the better off we're going to be. Because one of the things that the devil loves to do is to separate people. To break up marriages, to break up families, to break up ministries. To break up people that are trying to serve God together. He likes to come in between because he doesn't want them to be effective for God. He's always looking how he can mess things up between people. So many times what I've noticed in my 15 years of doing this, if I see two men at Righteous Oaks that are button heads... They never even knew each other they got the righteous oaks. Or I see two women down here, button heads, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. If those two women understood the power of the fact that they don't war against flesh and blood, and they could learn to reconcile with one another and begin to serve God, they shake the kingdom of God. And the devil knows that, and he's not going to let it happen. He's going to put as much enmity between them as he possibly can, because he knows what they're going to accomplish together. Y'all need to think about that. The next time somebody rubs you the wrong way a little bit. Doesn't speak to you just the way you want to be spoken to. Doesn't treat you just the way you want to be treated. You need to stop and say, hold on, I don't war against this person. This is not about this person. This is about the devil trying to mess with me with this person. If you'll receive the power of that in your life, it'll make your life so much better. Awesome. Now, put on the armor because you're warring against... The heavenlies is what you're warring against. And so, God has come and He said, Look, you know it's not working for you. Trust me. Rest in my mighty power. And look, here's just some armor you can put on that will protect you. 
But you know what he sees when you hold that armor out? He sees that smug look on your face. Yeah, I, psh, you can keep that armor, God. I don't need no armor. I take care of myself. I'm a man. I'm bulletproof. I don't need your armor. God knows that's how we react as human beings. So he stops and explains. Wait a minute, Mr. or Ms. Smug, who think you got it all together that you don't need my armor. Let me explain something. Y'all ain't warned against each other. Y'all are warned against the things of hell. So let me tell you one more time. And then he says this. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. I'm telling you to put it on. I'm not offering it to you. I'm telling you to put it on. I just explained to you why you need to put it on. Put it on. That's how he's saying it at that time. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can stand your ground. And when you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. Do y'all know when the day of evil's coming? Today. Tomorrow. The next day. The women of Jacob's well don't get to watch television much. They certainly don't get to watch the news all the time. And some of the hideous stuff that's on television today. I've got 125 channels on Dish at my house and I can watch two. That I'll let my eyes fall on. And one of them's in trouble. But I'm so glad you don't. Because just a few weeks ago, a man took an automatic weapon and walked into a kindergarten and blew away 24 and 5 and 6 year old children, innocent children and their teachers. You know what that is? That's evil. That's all it is. It's pure evil. And the world is full of it. The Bible tells us that terrible times are coming. Terrible times are here. <laughs> yeah, they're here. And we are surrounded by them. And it's not a good situation. And so we got, to, we got to learn that the day of evil is already here. And so when we have done everything to stand, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute, we got to stand firm then. Now, when I think of standing firm, this is the little thing that pops into my head. I spent a few years in the Army Reserve, and I had to go off to basic training. We went out on what they call field maneuvers where you have to go out and sleep in the field on the ground and act like you're out in the field in a battle situation. And the second lieutenant pulls Private Haynes over and he says, Private Haynes, you see that oak tree right over there? Yes, sir. You see that stump sticking up right over there? Yes, sir. Well, that's your area. That's your ground that you've got to stand and make sure the enemy doesn't come through here on maneuvers tonight. So we got people going to come in and they're going to act like the enemy. And that's, you've got to stand your ground between that oak tree and that stump right over there and make sure the enemy doesn't get in. Well, what about over on the other side? No, don't worry about the other side. All you've got to worry about is the ground I'm giving you to stand. Oak tree to the stump, but don't you let the enemy come through. See, that's the way life is. Because God sent us here with a purpose and a plan for our lives. And in that purpose and that plan is ground that we're supposed to be standing. And we are not standing. We are not standing for Christ Jesus, yet we call ourselves Christians. We're ashamed to admit we're Christians. Because we don't know if the people that we're talking to are, and they might not like us as much. We're afraid to bring up Jesus at work, because our boss may not like it. We're afraid to put up a, a, a nativity scene in our front yard, because our neighbor may not like it. We become politically correct as Christians. We're not standing for Christianity. We're not standing for Christ. And we're not standing for what we say we believe. That's the first problem. The, the most dangerous enemy of Christianity today is Christians. It's not the ACLU. It's not the atheist. It's not people taking us to court to try to pull the Ten Commandments off the walls of the courthouse and stuff like that. It's Christians who say they're Christians but won't practice it. And so the world looks at them well, he calls himself a Christian, lives like that. I'm just going to hang out here in the world. And we're driving people away from a relationship with God. So that's the thing. But the other thing we're supposed to stand for, men. Men in this room. We were created for a purpose. 
That purpose was to grow up and mature and find a young woman that God presents to us that we want to cleave unto and live with for the rest of our life as our life partner with Christ at the head of our relationship. And we marry that woman and we begin to raise a family with her. We, we, we increase because God wants us to increase. And we have a challenge that He's given us to by, by God as men that we should love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for it. The man is supposed to stand as a spiritual leader of his family. He is the spirit guide. He is the spirit leader. He is the one who makes sure that his wife is washed in the water of the Word daily. That his children are washed in the water of the Word daily. That they are in church every time the door is open, wherever it is that they worship. That they're teaching good worship habits and Bible study habits and prayer habits to their children. That's, that's the job that we have as men. But what are we doing? Our men have abandoned our women. And they are not in the family and they're not taking care of the wife, nor are they taking care of the children. And the families are not complete and God's plan is not in place and our world is a wreck. It's not God's intention for a woman to be with a man, not be married, and him give her a child and leave and cut out and she never sees him again. That's not God's intention. And when those things happen, it brings down a curse on that woman's life. Because she has to now be the father and the mother. Or if it's a reverse situation and the woman's messed up, the father has to be the father and the mother. That's not God's plan. And we look around and we say, gosh, I wonder what's wrong with the United States of America. It's that our families are being torn apart by the devil. And we are succumbing to his lies. We've got to stop. Ladies, you were created with a purpose. You were created to receive the seed of a man and to give birth to a child and to give increase to God's kingdom and to nurture that child. That's what a mother is for. She is to nurture a child. A man can't nurture a child the way a mother can. Well, I never intended to be that way. But when mothers are absent from their children's lives, they are not being properly nurtured, even if dad is there. God never intended to be nurtured by the grandparents or their aunts or their uncles or their brothers or their sisters. He gave that child to you. And you may have received a child, you may have gotten a child in your life under some really strange circumstances that you didn't really uh, expect or approve of. But you know what? God allowed it. That's God's creation. And once that child is created, it's the responsibility of those who created it to nurture it, to love it, to lift it up, to give it a good life. That, that's what it is. But we're not standing our ground. And we've got to start standing it. Well, brother child, that, 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 that drug use, that's going on. That, that's, that's four or five houses down for me. I, that ain't none of my business. What's four or five houses from you today will be in the house next door tomorrow. It will be in your backyard next week. It will be in your living room the week after that. We've got to take a stand. You can't allow things to come into your house. They're a danger to your children because gentlemen and ladies, we are supposed to stand the ground for our children and make sure that nothing comes in that's going to endanger their little hearts and their little minds to the best of our ability. And it gets harder every day. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. And then he starts telling us how. Ladies, listen to me. Stand firm then, first weapon, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The classic <clears throat> symptom, a classic symptom of drug addiction and alcoholism is a lying tongue, a manipulative tongue, a trying to get away with something tongue. I know because I did it for 52 years of my life until I met Jesus. So I'm not just an observer. I'm a, I've been a participator in the process. And I told a lie when the truth fit better. And I would manipulate you out of anything I could if it would help me some way or another. And I ain't alone in this room today. The belt of truth 
It's, it's the first, it's, I think it's interesting that it's the first weapon that God mentions, and without it, there's no sense in putting on the rest of them, I can tell you that right now. Until you are willing to face the truth about yourself, not anybody else around you, not what anybody else has done, until you're willing to face the truth about yourself, and what you have become, and what you are responsible for, and what you can do about it in Christ, you're not dealing in the truth. And it's powerful and it's important. There's a problem with the truth. The women of Jacob's well know it because you struggle with it daily. It's what makes a lot of women get up and leave. The truth hurts. It hurts bad. To have to, I have done things in my life that are so egregious, I didn't even want to hear it come out of my own mouth where my own ears could hear it. There's a Christian song, there's places in my heart where even I won't go. And the things in my life I didn't even want to say out loud that I had done. But there's something about the truth. It hurts. But knowing the truth, according to God's word, sets you free. So when we begin to take responsibility for who we are, what we've become, and why, and we start to deal in the truth instead of a lie, our life begins to change radically. And I, and I want to say this to you. If you're used to lying... And I, and I was. I lied when the truth fit better. If you've if, if you got a lying spirit on you, just confess the fact that you do it and admit it to God and ask Him to help you. Psalms 139 says, Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it. I read that Psalms 139 one night and I had a problem with profanity. Bad one. Couldn't say a sentence without a word of profanity in it. I said, God... You just said to me in Psalms 139 that before a word is on my lips, you know it. So I'm asking you in Jesus' name, control my lips. Don't let me use profanity. Don't let me lie. Help me with this problem in my life. I want to be rid of it. And you know what? He started helping me with it. And I can remember the times I was about to tell a dirty joke or about to say a word of profanity or about to lie to somebody and I'd get that check. A little check in my spirit. Holy Spirit, uh-huh, hop, 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 hop. And he stopped me just long enough that it wouldn't happen. And I can remember I used to break into a smile, and I'd say, boy, that was awesome right there. Because I was about to say that. Or I was about to do that. And he stopped me. And eventually, he just pushed it away. And, and, I, and I learned something great. It's so much fun to tell the truth. Even when it hurts, it's more fun to tell the truth than it is to tell a lie. And the results are extremely better. So put on the belt of truth. Go look at yourself in the spirit mirror of life, ladies and families. Double dog dare you. Triple dog dare you. To go home and look in the mirror in your bedroom, your bathroom, wherever you want to go. And instead of worrying about if your hair is combed right or your makeup's on good or you need to clip some ear hair out or something, say so that. Look deep into your own soul. And come face to face with the fact of who you really are. And talk to yourself. Charlie Haynes, you got a lot of people fooled, but you are a dark, depraved, perverted man inside. And if you keep living like that, you're going to pay for it. You got you to get real. In the spirit mirror of life, and, and begin to deal in truth, and it will, it will absolutely set you free. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and with the breastplate of righteousness in place, what does that mean, Brother Charlie? It means that you're doing the right thing on purpose all the time. You're living a righteous or a right life. Well, how do I know what's right? Read this word. Don't go ask Uncle Billy and Aunt Sally what's right. Because they're going to tell you what they think. And it ain't going to be good either. Go ask God what he thinks. And if you read his word enough, you're going to know what he thinks. As soon as the, as the opportunity arises for you to do something one way or the other, you're going to know. Put the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. What does that mean, Brother Charlie? It means that you have read this word so much, and you have studied this word so much, and it is so deeply driven into your heart, mind, soul, and spirit that any time any decision comes before you to do anything, 
It will be measured by what God thinks about it. You, know, you may not be able to quote the exact scripture and verse that tells you that you ought to or you not ought to, but you know how God feels about it. See, if, if you're going to graduate this program and you come to me and say, Pastor Charlie, uh, man, you know, it's been great being here at Jacob's Well and everything, and uh, uh, I appreciate everything y'all done for it. I just want to ask you for it. Do you think it'd be all right if I go back out and get in that unmarried relationship with my boyfriend when I leave here? I may not be able to give you the chapter and verse, but I can tell you this. God ain't going to like it. Because I know his will and his way, and I know what he thinks, and he's not up for that. He's looking for marriages with Christ at the head of it. He's not looking for unmarried relationships with no commitment. So I, you learn how he feels, and you, you have the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in you. You see, when Christ had the 40 days in the desert with the devil, and the devil messed with him, do you know what he used to defeat the devil? It is written. Devil, it's written. Thus say the Lord. It was the Word. He defeated him with the Word. Y'all, it's got to be in you. And you've got to be ready with it in you so that whatever pops up in your face and tries to do away with the righteous life you're living, you know it, you recognize it, you see it, and you react properly to it. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is important. Without faith, you cannot please God. That's what His Word says. Because you haven't seen God. You haven't seen Christ Jesus. You've seen pictures of him, but you have not seen the man, Christ Jesus, who walked this earth. You've not seen him crucified. You've not seen his empty tomb. You've not seen his ascension into heaven. You've not seen him sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you and me against the devil today. You've not seen the Holy Spirit. But in faith, you know there is a God. In faith, you know Christ died for you personally and individually so that you might not perish but have everlasting life. In faith, you know that there is a voice in you speaking to you from God. It is the Holy Spirit of God. Because as a, when you receive Christ, Christ places a deposit in you. That's what, that's what Ephesians 1 says. He places a deposit in you, guaranteeing your inheritance until the time of fulfillment has come. That deposit is called the Holy Spirit of God. And He's in you in fullness if you're a Christian. So, you need to understand the power of those things. But the shield of faith. Here's, here's what the devil showed me. The Bible that I preach out of now is called a parallel Bible. And it has, this particular one has two different versions of the Bible. It has the King James Version in the left-hand column. And it has the NIV in the right. Because when I got saved, the first Bible I was given was the NIV Bible. And based on what's happened in my life since then, I don't believe the devil put the NIV in my hand. <laughs> okay? But I was reading the NIV one night, and I was reading these scriptures that I'm talking to you about this morning. And it said, take up the shield of faith, which extinguished the flaming arrows of the evil one. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to go look up that same scripture in the King James Bible. So I'm milling around. And the truth is, I found one of your Bibles on the shelf. We were still living in Meridian then. And I found one of Asa's King James Bible stuck up on the shelf because I didn't have one. And I pulled it down and I went. And I read it. And here's what it says. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts. Not the flame here. The fiery darts of the wicked. And then he said, see that? I said, yes, sir. Go get your concordance and look it up and see what those words mean. Look up fiery and look up dart and see what it means. So I said, okay, Lord, I went in there. Fiery, in the Greek, is a word called P-U-R-O-O, -O, puro. And it means to kindle or to ignite or to be inflamed with anger, grief, or lust. That's what the fiery was translated as. And darts was the word balo, B-L-L-O, means to throw or to strike with violence or intensity. 
I said, wow. Because the devil is taking his fiery darts with anger and grief and lust and intensity and firing them at me. And if I'm going to stop it, I've got to put on the shield of faith. And then God showed me a vision. Now see, I talk about a lot of stuff. People say, oh, man, he's crazy as a best bug, isn't he? Well, I'm going to just tell you, you can believe it and flush it down the toilet. Whatever you want to do, it. I'm going to tell you what's happening to me, all right? He showed me a vision. I don't, God doesn't speak to me in dreams. He speaks to me in visions while I'm awake, and it looks like a little TV screen up there when he's talking to me. And he showed me a vision. He said, look here. And he showed me a room, and in the room was a large table, and on that table was many different kinds of bows. It was compound bows, regular bows, big bows, small bows, cross bows. Every kind of bow you can think of. And right next to it was another table, and it was filled with all shapes and sizes and lengths of arrows. But every arrow had a little look like rag wrapped around the point of it. And I remembered when I was a kid watching cowboy and Indian movies, and they would light the arrows on fire and shoot them into the thatch huts on people's houses and burn them down. And some of y'all might have seen that. Yes, that's how they would attack, with a burning arrow. And then, beside the table of the bows and beside the table of the arrows, there was this wall. And all around that wall were shelves. And on every shelf was a one gallon, looked like a one gallon paint bucket. And on every paint bucket was written the name. Hatred, bigotry, prejudice, anger, rebellion, lust, fornication, homosexuality. It's wrong, wrong. Everyone had a name. And God said, every time Satan wants to light you up, Charlie Haynes, he reaches up and grabs that bucket of lust. And he dips that arrow down in it, rolls it around in there, and he lights you up with it. Because that's what lit me up. I was lustful. That's what he does to us. That's why we need the shield of faith. And the larger your faith gets, the bigger your shield gets. So the harder it is for him to hit you with anything. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Well, that sounds good, Brother Charlie. How do I get some of that? You get on your knees and ask him for it. Because faith comes from God. <laughs> That's where it comes from. Well, Lord, I got faith. But man, I must need some more faith. My, my, my shield ain't big enough, Lord. He's still getting to me. Pray for faith. And God will start to increase your faith. And you know how he's going to increase your faith? Through experiencing him. You can read about God in the Word. You can hear God preached about. You can see movies about Christ. You can see movies about Jesus. You can see all kinds of stuff. But when you begin to experience Him in your life, moving, changing, transforming, healing, redeeming, and restoring like we get to see every day at Jacob's Well, man, your shield gets real big. Have some faith. Walk it out in faith. Even when you don't understand, God's definition of faith is this. It's being sure of what you hope for, but certain of what you do not see. I remember one day I was at church camp with a, with a pastor that ordained me. His name's Jack Giles. And I was walking around out there at this place called Lake Teocotta. That's where we were. And I was wanting to be in the ministry so bad. Wasn't, wasn't ordained yet. Wasn't a pastor yet. Just hanging out with Brother Jack at his church. God said, I'd like to work with you, Brother Charlie, but you ain't got but a half of faith, brother. I said, what, what, what you mean by that? He said, go, go look at Hebrews chapter 11. You're sure what you hope for, but you're not so sure what you don't see. I can't work with somebody with a faith like that. You've got, you got to not only be sure what you hope for, you've got to be certain that I'm going to deliver. That I'm going to take I'm not going to send you anywhere that I haven't already prepared you to go. And I'm not going to send you anywhere that I'm not going to hold you all the way through. I'm going to hold your hand through it and I'm going to get you there. There'll be trials, but I'm going to get you there. Y'all, faith is so important. It's just awesome. Put on the shield of faith so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. Oh, why, why is salvation a helmet, Brother Charlie? Because it protects your mind. Y'all know what this is up here? It's the devil's playground. That's what this is up here. 
That's why Joyce Meyer wrote the great, awesome book in Bible study, Battlefield of the Mind. This is where the battle goes on up here. Battle up here, love of Christ down here. There's a lot of people that are walking out of Christian life as an intellectual agreement. They don't have a heart agreement. They got an intellectual agreement. Well, I'm going to go to church on Sunday and I'm going to go on Wednesday night and I'm going to try to become a deacon or an elder in my church and I'm going to show leadership and all that because that's my duty, you know, and to let people know. That's the intellectual. God's looking at the heart. He ain't looking at the mind because our mind stays messed up. We let it. But the, sal the sal helmet of salvation protects your mind and allows you to have more of a heart relationship with God. It's powerful stuff, y'all. And I don't know the I don't know the testimony or the uh, or the spiritual position of anybody in this room, except myself. And I'm not even sure I know all that. God knows it, but I'm not sure I even know all of it. But y'all, we need to walk out our Christianity. We we need to, we need to bear the fruit of our Christianity. And if there's somebody in this room. And as an adult human being, fully understanding the commitment that you're making when you do it, you've not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I highly recommend it. Because God can't pour out His blessings on you if you're not going to receive His Son as your Savior. You're holding Him up with what He wants to do for you. It's important. And anybody can say they're saved. That's no big deal. Somebody says you're, they're saved, you have to kind of take their word for it. You don't know. But God knows. And there's a litmus test. If you all know what a litmus test is, it means a test. It used to be in chemistry. I don't guess they do it no more. But in chemistry, you used to have a little piece of paper and you'd stick it in an acid or an alkaline or whatever color it turned. It told you what that was. There's a litmus test. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says this. If a man or a woman be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So if I'm going to call myself a Christian, let me tell you what I'm going to be doing every day. I'm going to be going back, getting back in that spirit mirror of life. I'm going to say, well, Lord, what's new about me today? And boy, I can start, I can start naming it all. Yeah, this and this and this is new about me. And feeling all good. Got my chest all poked out and I broke three buttons off my shirt. I'm feeling so good about it. But then I've got to have the guts to look back in there and say, okay, what's old about me, God? Because it's what's old that's still about you that's going to keep you from being everything God wants you to be. Oh, you can have a whole bunch of new stuff going on, but what about the, what's that old thing that's still... What is the sin that so easily entangles? What is the thing that so easily hinders that Hebrews talks about that's still in your life? It's got to go. It's got to get out of there. So, if you're going to receive Christ, understand the power of what it is that you're doing. What you're saying that you're doing. Romans says, if you confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and believe that He was raised from the dead, you will be saved. That's what it said. But it's a little trickier than that because you've got to understand what you're saying when you say He's Lord. Go get your Webster's Dictionary and look up the definition of what Lord is and check me on this. It says it is a person who has complete authority and autonomy over your life. That's what a Lord is. So you're saying what God wants you to be saying from the heart is, Lord, I'm giving Christ Jesus complete authority over my life. Complete autonomy. Whatever He says do, I'm doing it. And whatever he says don't do, I ain't doing it. I don't care how good it smells, how good it feels, how good it sounds. I ain't doing it if Jesus don't want me to do it. That's autonomy and authority of Christ over your life. And when you're living like that, there's going to be a whole lot new about you and very little old. I can tell you that. It's awesome. And you don't have to read the Bible all the way through. I'm, I say this all the time. You don't have to read the Bible all before you start living by it. Start out in Genesis 1.1. And the first thing you run up on that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing, quit. Start off in Genesis 1.1, the first book of the Bible. And the first thing you come up on that God says you're supposed to be doing and you're not, get to doing it. And work your way on back to Revelation. You'll get there eventually. 
But start living your life according to the word that you have read and, pra and put it in practice. Don't wait till the end. Lord, have mercy. Take to the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Sword of the Spirit. Do you have one? But more important, has it got you? See, I, I, I struggle all the time about putting scriptures up on these screens. I'm not going to quit doing it. But I, what would really be great is everybody had a Bible. They were reading out of the Bible while the pastor was preaching, whatever, whatever church you're in. So you're reading out of the Word. And what, so you're studying the Word and going through it. You know where it is. Somebody says, go to Ephesians. You know where that is. If you watch it on the screen for six months, you ain't going to know where Ephesians is in the Bible. You're going to know it's there, evidently, because they're showing it, but you don't know where it's at. <laughs> so, guys, we got to use the sword. I don't know how many of y'all have ever watched Conan the Barbarian. There's a scene in there where old Arnold Schwarzenegger stands up on this big rock, and he's got this sword, and he's swinging it over his head and around, doing all kind of fancy dance stuff, with practicing with his sword. I could go down to an antique shop right now and I could buy the biggest, longest, sharpest, fanciest looking sword they got and the scabbard to go with it. I can strap it on my belt. I can start strutting around. Yeah. Showing that sword. Hey, look at y'all. I'm a swordsman. Yeah, he must be a swordsman. He's wearing that sword, man. First time somebody approached me that wanted to kill me with a sword, I'd be dead meat. You know why? Because I don't know how to use no sword. I probably wouldn't even be able to get it out of the, out of the scabbard to be done rusted up in there the time I had it. Carrying a sword don't make you a swordsman. Practice with this word. Practice with it every day of your life. Practice with it understanding it's going to save your life. Let me tell you about the condition of this room. I can look around and I can see some smiles on some faces and I'm glad. But you know what this is in the spirit realm? This is an emergency room. This is a 911 situation. If you could see it in the spirit realm, there's people laying on a table bleeding from every part of their body about to die because of the life they're living and the consequences they found themselves in. That's what's in this room. That's why I love preaching here. Because I ain't got to say, but I wonder which one of them might have a problem today. Everybody's got a problem today. Because you're either in the program or you love somebody that is. And even if you're not in the program and you love somebody, you probably got your problems too. I love that about this place. Because you can deal in the truth here. You don't have to try to pretend and act like something isn't what it is. Because we got a Jesus that can fix it. So we can all rejoice in that. But practice with this thing. Apply it to your life. Begin to live by it and let it make a difference in how you're going to live and spend the rest of your life on this earth till you go home to be with Him. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's got to be, a, in my life experience and in the life experience of people that I know that will open up to me and talk to me, that's got to be the weakest weapon that we have is prayer. We practice it less than any of the others. And it's a shame. Because the first way that you can tell that a relationship between, between two people is breaking down, you know how it is? They don't talk to each other anymore. Re just read any psychology book, any psychologist book, anything. That's the number one sign of a breakdown of a marriage is that people quit talking to each other. They live in the same house and don't even speak. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't want to talk to God, and that's what prayer is. You don't want to talk to God, you don't want to know Him. You don't have any relationship with Him. You can say it, you can chip your teeth all day long to whoever you want to. You don't want to talk to Him, you don't want to know Him. You don't want to talk to Him and you don't stay on your knees in prayer. You don't want to hear what He's got to say. Because prayer ain't all about you. Prayer is about God speaking to you as well. I challenge you all. I don't know what kind of prayer life you got. But whatever it is, let's be generous. Let's say you get out on your knees by yourself somewhere privately and pray 10 minutes a day. And that's being generous on some people. 
Most people, it's a blessing over the meal. If they're not embarrassed that somebody else might be offended by it, or now lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep five in. Prayer. Let's say that you're doing it ten minutes a day. Double dog dare you. Get on your knees this afternoon and say, God, I'm going to accept the challenge you made to me through Pastor Charlie Haynes today because I know you talking to me because I ain't got much of a prayer life. And I, I, I'm confessing, I don't pray about ten minutes a day on a good day. So I tell you what I'm going to do for the next seven days. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm not getting up till twenty minutes has passed. Don't care if I run out of stuff state. I ain't getting off my knees in prayer till 20 minutes has passed. And next week it's going to be 30. And the next week 40. And the next week 50. Until I get to where I'm praying an hour a day in private with you. I dare you to do it. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. Stuff you ain't even even thought of. When you, when you fervently get on your knees and pray to God for 30 or 40 minutes at a time you're going to find yourself weeping uncontrollably. You're going to find yourself having things brought into your spirit and brought back up into your heart that you hadn't thought about in years that need to be confessed and repented of. It's going to happen. Some of you are going to have the Holy Spirit of God prompt you to pray to Him in other tongues. And I know people don't like to talk about that, but it's biblical, ladies. He'll prompt you to pray to Him in other tongues. And you won't even know what you're saying, but he does. It's so important. And when you get to the point, if you say, I'm going to stay down here 30 minutes, and you get to the end of 20, and you ain't got nothing else to say, and you stay down there, you know what's going to happen? He's going to start talking. Give him an opportunity. Let it be a two-way conversation. Ask him questions. Dare you to. Dare. You ever ask God questions when you're in prayer? Get home at night, lay in the bed. I love to pray at night in the bed when I, when I go to sleep. Amen. Lord, you know what? I, I feel like today was an awesome day. I feel, I feel like I've done everything that you have prompted me to do today to touch the lives of hopeless and helpless people. And I'm feeling really good about it. But, if there's somewhere I failed you today, God, would you tell me what it was? Oh, you don't want to ask him that. You don't want to ask him. Because he's going to tell you. Yeah, you did pretty good. But you remember when you stopped for gas at that little service station up there in Poplarville? And you were pumping gas. And I showed you a guy sitting in a, in a car over there about two pumps away. And I said to you, you need to walk over there and pray for that guy right there. He needs prayer this morning. You just put your nozzle back into the tank. And you got in your car and you drove off. You didn't go pray with him. Well, I didn't know him, Lord. Don't make a difference. <laughs> Y'all, it's awesome. What can happen to you in prayer if you'll press in. And then I'm going to close with this because this is important, y'all. Those of you who are going to be worshiping here as a part of this family for a while, I'm asking you personally to apply this. And those of you who worship at other places that normally work at, worship at a different church, I want you, I'm, I'm pleading with you to apply it. Because this is what the man who wrote all these scriptures we've looked at this morning, Paul, said. He said, pray for me also. That whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The day that I can't stand in this pulpit and say what God tells me to say in my spirit is the day I'm going to find me a job selling cars or something. The day I become politically correct because I'm afraid I'm going to offend somebody sitting in the congregation, I need to go get me a job selling cars or something. Because pastors are supposed to stand their ground in the pulpit. And they're supposed to preach God's word. And, and we're getting in this world, I am so sad. We're getting where all the preaching is becoming warm and fuzzy because we don't want to offend the congregation. Because you know what they're going to do? Grab their tithe and run out the back door with it. And how are we going to pay what we got to pay and build what we got to build if we start running people off by talking about homosexuality and fornication and adultery and all these things that go on in a church? 
We've got to stand up. Pray for your pastors. You want to hear a good sermon? Before you get to the church where the pastor is, whoever he is, and you say, Lord, I want you to do something for me today. When Pastor Charlie gets up there, let him rock my world today. Let him say to me what I need to hear, whether I want to hear it or not. Let him speak the truth from his heart, led by the Holy Spirit, whether I want to hear it or not. If I walk away convicted and offended, that's my problem. I need to take it up with God, not Pastor Charlie Haynes. But it's the same for every pastor. Pray that your pastors in your churches will not become politically correct. And they'll keep preaching against the things, the sin that is in their church, which is certainly in there. Because we got to do something to start taking this world back. And it can start with some good pastors preaching fearlessly. But don't go in there praying, oh, I hope you don't talk about my situation this morning, because I don't want to... Even... It's, it's amazing how many people come up to, and I, do, I know they do it to all pastors. Come up to me, I don't, listen, when I come up here, I ain't got nobody in here in mind. I got everybody in mind. No temptation has seized me that is not common to man. That's what God, so I can preach and know that you've probably been through the same stuff. But, but I have people come to me, boy, Brother Charlie, I felt like he was talking straight to me this morning. Well, praise God then. Hallelujah. What you going to do about it? Lord, have mercy. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for taking this messed up, sick, depraved, sorry man and having mercy on me. Loving me in spite of my faults knowing that you could take me if I would submit to you and do the same thing that you did with Saul, who became Paul. Make me a chosen instrument. Even though I don't deserve it. Even though I shake my head in wonderment and just say, how in the world did I ever find myself in a position that God would even trust me to hold a Bible in my hand? That he would allow me to open and speak one word, one verse out of his word, the way I live my life. But God, I know it's because you had a plan and a purpose for me. And you just kept persisting. You kept giving me a full dose of what it was I thought I wanted. till I finally, finally decided to trust you. Finally decided to rest in your mighty power. Finally decided to put on and keep on the armor of God. Thank you for that, God. But I confess one thing right now that I know. You don't love me one bit more, nor am I one whit more special to you than any man or woman sitting in this room today. You love every one of them just as much as you love me. You have the same giftings and equippings and anointings and blessings and future and hope for them that you had for me. You're just waiting. Just waiting patiently. For them to say, Lord, I'm going to start resting in your mighty power. I'm going to trust your son Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. And I'm going to shut out the voices of men and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God for the rest of my days on this earth. And God, I'm going to become a walking, living testimony. And nobody that comes within a city block of me can be around me and not know that I love Christ Jesus with everything that's in me and I stand for Him and what He believes and what His will and His word and His way says. And they're not going to sway me from it. And I'm not going to be in the company of anybody that wants to participate in anything any different. God, give us all that commitment today. Make us practicing Christians, not just lip service Christians. Let us touch the lives of the hopeless and hurting who are looking for somebody in the Christian world with some fruit on their limbs, God, instead of just blossoms. God, let us bear fruit. Right across the street from our house, right down the road from where we live, are broken and hurting and helpless people who need Jesus in their life. God, give us the courage to go minister to them. Give us the courage to get up out of the four walls of our church where we're comfortable with our basketball programs and our gymnasiums and our spaghetti cookings and get out of there in the streets and the alleyways where the harvest is. The harvest is not in the barn. It's in the field, God. Challenge us with that. Get us in the field today. 
Lord, thank you for your son Christ Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. As we leave this place right now, we go start to have our fellowship. I just pray that every word that is said between us will be pleasing to your ear, God. And I pray that everything that is demonstrated, everything that is done, will be pleasing to your eye. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.